Good evening and welcome to Public Observatory Night presented by the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. My name is Nadia Whitehead and I'm a public affairs officer here at the CFA. I'm pleased to present tonight's event, a tour of the night sky with the Harvard Clay Telescope in a virtual format. We're streaming to both Facebook and YouTube tonight. We'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation, but if you have a comment or question during the presentation, just type it into the comments section on Facebook or YouTube and we'll try to get to them. We'll also try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the telescope observations. If you're interested in receiving our e-newsletter and information about future events, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list by visiting the link that's appearing on the screen now. Now, I'm super excited to present tonight's extraordinary guest speakers, Allison Borilla and Zach Murray who will be introducing us to the Harvard Clay Telescope and then doing live observations of space. This is the first time we've ever streamed live from the Clay Telescope during observatory night. I expect it's gonna be a great show, but please be patient as we work with the team to switch between live telescope observations, PowerPoint presentations, et cetera. I also wanted to mention that yesterday, forecasters predicted, predicted clear skies, but today we have some scattered clouds. We're going to do our best to show you the night sky, but bear with us if there are any weather issues. Now, here's a little bit more about tonight's presenters. Allison is an astronomer at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. She manages the astronomy lab and telescopes used for undergraduate courses at Harvard University. Her research involves confirming and characterizing exoplanets that were discovered by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. Zach is a fifth year graduate student at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. His research involves understanding the dynamics of planets and small solar system bodies. Zach is a Bronx native who earned a degree in physics from Cornell before joining us in Cambridge. Join me in welcoming Zach and Allison, who should be appearing on the screen now. There's Allison to the left and Zach to the right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I think they're going to kick it off with a brief PowerPoint. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, this behind us is the Clay Telescope. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I hope you are all nice and warm and cozy. It is a very chilly, chilly night here in uh, Cambridge. There's even some snowflakes forecast. So uh, as Nadia mentioned, um, there are uh, some lingering clouds and a little bit of wind, but we're going to work around it, I hope, and see some fun stuff tonight. So um, yeah, we're going to jump right in. I um, We're going to go through a few PowerPoint slides. We just wanted to give you an overview of some of the telescopes here at Harvard and orient you to where we are. And then we'll get, uh, we'll get to some fun observing um, of some planets and some other deeper sky objects. Um, so we can go ahead um, and to the next slide. So just to orient everyone, let's see, there we go. Um, we are uh, at uh, one more image, please. So there's two images on here and a, and a map. And it shows, uh, so on the top left is the Center for Astrophysics. It's the back side of the building, if you've ever been here in Cambridge. Um, and uh, it is about a 15 to 20 minute walk from the main part of Harvard's un university's campus. And the building on the right is the Science Center building. Um, so if you've ever been to campus, you probably can't miss this building. It's very unique um, in its structure. It's also um, one of the main hubs for students. Uh, it's the main science building. So it houses the physics, uh, biology, chemistry. Basically, every student at some point will take a course here in science of gen ed or, or, or above. Um, but the main thing to note here is, is there about 15, 20 minute walk, depending on how fast you walk. Um, and But the CFA is actually on, on Harvard's edge of the campus. It's a Harvard owned building. Um, and you'll notice on top of these um, buildings are these domes and they're all telescope domes. So what I wanted to point out here, um, so if you put the first arrow, that big dome on the top left is actually the Great Refractor Telescope. So this is a very historic telescope. And I'll have a brief slide on each of these telescopes just to, to show you what they look like. Um, behind that dome uh, is another telescope, which we actually don't, isn't shown in this image. Um, it's called the Clark Telescope. And that telescope is what we use for public um, open houses when they're in person. There's a, an image, um, I, I'm not sure if you could see my pointer, but it's on the, the top left image on the, on the left side. That's actually another telescope, which I'm not gonna talk about, it's a radio telescope. And then in the foreground here is a, is, is a shed that's no longer there, it's just storage, it's not actually a telescope. Um, 
And then if you look at the Science Center image, there's a couple more, uh, you can bring up the, the arrows. The first is the, the top, um, at the basically on the eighth floor. Sorry, you're gonna, if you heard that, you're gonna hear that from time to time. That's the dome, it rotates as the Earth. So as the Earth rotates, um, the telescope is tracking objects. So we're currently pointed at an object. And as the Earth rotates, the telescope is rotating with it. And so the dome rotates in bigger chunks. So the telescope's smoothly rotating, but the dome will rotate in a chunk when it gets to the edge of the field. So from time to time, you might hear that. Um, so even though we're expecting it, we might get scared or <laughs> thrown off too, because it, it's always unexpected. So as I was saying, on the eighth, uh, eighth floor of the Science Center is the astronomy lab. So we, we actually have an observing deck there with a solar telescope. So we can do daytime observations of the sun. And, um, and then we also, on top of the Science Center, there's two domes. So the first arrow is pointing to the Loomis Michael Telescope, which is our undergraduate astronomy club telescope. And then on the right, if there's one more uh, telescope dome is the clay telescope. And that's actually where Zach and I are right now. So we're on top of the Science Center. Okay, so that's orientating you to where some of the telescopes are when, when we go through these slides. So the next slide um, is just a brief uh, history of the of the CFA or the Center for Astrophysics. Um, it's actually, it was, it was established in 1973, but it's made up of two separate entities. So the Harvard College Observatory was founded in 1839, and that's part of the Harvard College um, that exists now. And then the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory was actually founded in 1890. Um, and it was, it's part of the, the greater DC Smithsonian. So it actually started in DC, but in 1955, it, um, they, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory came to Cambridge. And then these two observatories were kind of working together. So in 1973, um, it was established as the Center for Astrophysics um, under one director. So these two, um, HCO and SAO still exist under the umbrella of the Center for Astrophysics, but now we have a single director. Um, it's confusing to a lot of people, so I just thought I'd throw that in there real quick. So the next slide uh, is jumping into the telescope. So the Great Refractor Telescope is, is a very famous telescope. It's got a lot of historical um, interest. It was installed in 1847 at, at the CFA, uh, before it was even the CFA, I guess. <laughs> And for 20 years, it was the largest telescope in, in the United States. Um, the telescope itself is 15 inches. So when you, you hear the size of a telescope, what that means is the size of the, the lens or the mirror. So there's different types of telescopes. This is a refracting telescope. So it's made up of lenses. More modern telescopes are made up of mirrors, a, a glass mirror with a reflective aluminum coating that reflects the light. And they can be much more compact. But these, the refracting telescopes, the older telescopes, like Galileo's telescope, is, is, uh, are these long tubes. So it's a 20-foot tube um, made of mahogany. It's a, it's a gorgeous telescope, um, if you ever get a chance to see it. Um, and the dome itself is also gorgeous. It's, it's this 30-foot dome. And it, if you can tell from the picture, maybe, there's like wood interior made from whaling ship. It's very, very pretty. And the exterior is a copper, uh, a copper exterior, sheathed in copper. And it weighs 14 tons, so it's a very massive structure. And the telescope itself sits on this pier. So this, um, it's a granite pier, and it's about 11 feet, and it weighs 11 tons. And it actually goes down into the ground. So this is a few flights up on the CFA, um, and it goes down into the ground about 20 feet, and it's about 20-some feet in diameter as well. Um, so a massive structure really stabilizing the telescope. Um, and this telescope um, is historic because it had, it was, like I said, state of the art for, for many years when it was first installed. It discovered a moon of Saturn, uh, inner rings of Saturn. It, it did a lot of early photography um, and, of stars and, 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 it, um, and the, um, the glass plates at Harvard, the Harvard um, collection of glass plates. Um, there's a huge collection from, um, from this telescope. So, one other thing I want to point out before we go to the next slide is this telescope, um, these old refracting telescopes are, are manual, so you have to move them with your hands and find an object on the sky. So you can imagine, so uh, let's see, I hope you can see my uh, mouse, but basically the part to the right of the screen is where the eyepiece would be. So this is where you'd actually put your, your eye and look through the telescope. And then at the end here, the top, the top part of the image is where the light would come in. So you can imagine if we're looking lower on the horizon down here, the eyepiece part would be up really high. So that's what this chair is for. This is called the observer's chair. And 
in this chair, you could have two people sitting here and it moves up and down. So you can actually rotate this chair around the room and move it up and down depending on what you're looking at. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the, the next telescope is the Clark Refractor. So this is the, the dome that's also at the CFA that wasn't in the image. So uh, it, it is a, a slightly smaller dome. It's a nine inch telescope. Um, and this telescope is used for in-person CFA public talks. Um, and it's also open to the CFA community. And again, this is a refractor. So it's got the lenses, it's the long tube, all manual again. Okay, next slide. Um, so now we're over at the Science Center. So this is actually the bigger dome um, on the roof of the Science Center. It's a 10 inch refractor. Um, this is the Undergraduate Astronomy Club, the student astronomers at Harvard Radcliffe. Um, they do um, wonderful events. I'm an advisor to that club. They do open houses, movie nights, dark sky trips. They have an astrophotography club. It's, it's a super fun group. Uh, they train the broader Harvard community how to use the telescope. Um, and and, as, and as I said, do do these fun um, events for the community. Okay, one more slide, and then we'll get to the we'll get to the observing while you're all here. So um, this is the telescope we're at. So you can you can hopefully see it behind me. You'll see it in a minute. Um, but this is the clay telescope. Um, now this telescope is actually the largest of the ones we talked about, but it looks smaller in in my opinion um, because it's more compact, and that's because this is now. So this is a 16 inch telescope, but this is a reflecting telescope. So now it's using mirrors. So the advantage of that is it's multifold, but one of the big things is you can make smaller telescopes. And if you can make smaller telescopes, you can have smaller domes, less, less money to build it, et cetera. So the way this works is the light will come into the telescope and um, reflect off of this primary mirror at the bottom of the telescope and reflect to somewhere um, in the middle or so and there's a secondary mirror where the light then gets reflected back down um, through a hole in the primary mirror. And I don't know that you can tell from this image, but this dark stuff at the bottom of the telescope is the instruments. So when the light comes back through, it hits another mirror and then it gets directed to um, this, which is the eyepiece, which is actually where you will um, look if you were here um, observing at the telescope. But we can also move that mirror out of the way and then the light would fall directly onto the CCD camera. So we have a camera down here. And right in front of that camera is a filter wheel. So the filter wheel um, has different color filters. So on the right here, if you're an amateur astronomer, you know things about CCDs or detectors. I have some information about what types of cameras these are. Um, if this means nothing to you, go ahead and ignore it. It has no impact on <laughs> the observing we're about to do. But I just wanted to say that as the light comes in, um, you, the, I want to emphasize, I guess, the images that you see on the internet from Hubble or James Webb or any telescope, really, um, a lot of work goes into making those beautiful color images. And it isn't just pointing it to an image and taking a single image. The images come in and they're, they're, um, they go through a filter. So typically you would observe in like, for instance, blue, green, and red, um, and you would then combine those images. So it filters the light of that color you take the image and then you can combine those images. Um, MaximDL and the Sky software, those are the software we're gonna be using tonight. We have a spectrograph, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but this breaks the light into different wavelengths of light, similar to a prism. And you can observe and learn things about the chemical composition of stars or the temperature of stars, things like that. And the last thing I'll point out for those um, is at the bottom here, the ZWO are planetary cameras. So we're going to be using those to image the planets because planets are really bright. This is the, these are very high frame rate cameras. So it's essentially like a video camera. So we're going to put those on and you're going to kind of see an image that's almost like what your eye sees. It's a very similar um, resolution, I guess. Um, so I think I've said enough about the background. Let's um, do some observing. Um, Nadia, are you, you are muted, I think. If oh, you're trying to say sorry that. about that. No problem. Um, we actually had two really good questions from viewers, um, and I wanted to pose them to you really quick. Um, so why are domes helpful when using a telescope? And then also, um, isn't Cambridge, uh, doesn't it have a lot of light pollution? Isn't a, it a bad place for observations? Yeah, those are, those are good questions. Those are actually, I think, in some ways related. So, um, so the first one, so the dome, why do we have domes? 
So um, today is a perfect example of this. The wind is howling outside. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's it's actually at the limit where it's it's. So we have limits of when it's safe to have the telescope open because you know if a wind gust were to come in here, it could damage the telescope. The wind is coming from the north right now, so we're actually pointed to the south, so it's safe, but we're not going to point to the north because of the wind. So the wind is it's actually protecting us from the wind. When we actually get to observing, you're going to you're going to find out that um, the wind still has an impact. So so this is protecting us from some of that. That's uh, the atmospheric turbulence that we want to kind of avoid. And the second question, do you want to answer that? I forget what it was. <laughs> The second question was on the subject of light pollution, and you're absolutely right that Cambridge does indeed have a lot of light pollution. Um, how that affects what you see through the telescope depends on what you're looking at. Um, objects that are kind of compact or very bright, think the moon or planets, usually aren't affected too badly by light pollution. Dimmer objects like nebulae or galaxies can get washed out, though. So we'll start with some bright objects, and as the night moves on, we'll go towards uh, dimmer objects. Okay. Okay, so um, we're, we're excited that um, this is a wonderful time of year. There's some really exciting bright planets up, um, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, we're going to hit a couple of those at least. So we're pointed at Saturn right now, so we're going to start there. So I think if we, let's, we're just, we're both looking <laughs> to see that there's no clouds right now. Um, so yeah, I think if we go to the planetary camera, we can, um, before we do that, we'll show you what we're looking at too. So this is our sky, um, <clears throat> there's a all sky camera pointed at the sky. So right now we're not really seeing any clouds, which is good, but we're kind of, there's the dome again. As we monitor, as we go through the night, we're kind of keeping an eye on this because we're kind of enclosed in the dome to make sure we're not um, getting any clouds coming in. The bright ring around is, so this is like kind of a fisheye thing. So the bright ring around is actually the lights of Cambridge. So there's that light pollution you're talking about. Some some areas are worse than other. And when the Red Sox are playing, it's really bad in one direction. Um, right. Okay. So, well, Saturn? yeah, so here comes Saturn. Okay. Right. So you yeah. want to talk about Saturn? Here's a view of Saturn through the telescope. You can see a few interesting features. Firstly, Saturn has these very big and beautiful rings that are very obvious. There are some cloud bands on Saturn, which you might be able to make out. And if you look closely at the gap between the inner and outer ring, you can see it going all around the planet. That's the uh, Cassini division, um, first, first observed many years ago by Giovanni Cassini, um, that we can see here today. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just point out you can kind of see it um, shaking, right? So this is literally um, I don't know what the exposure time it's set to, but it's sub second exposure. It's like a video camera continually, um, continually taking images, and you can see how the the wind and the atmosphere is actually turbulent. Right now it's worse than than normal, but but even in good conditions you're going to get some of that turbulence. So I think that pulled up on that screen the wind speed. <laughs> um, I got rid of it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. But it is um, it is very windy here, so we're getting some of that that you could see here. Um, Shall we zoom out? Yeah. So if we moves? zoom out, we can also um, show you some of Saturn's uh, brighter moons, bigger moons, I guess, because they're not actually they're it's reflected light we're seeing. Let's get rid of this. And so Saturn's moon are um, actually very interesting in of themselves. Um, you may have heard of the moon Titan. It's one of it's the, the largest moon and it in the solar system and it actually has a um, an atmosphere which is um, unique to um, to the moons. Not not many have a, a substantial atmosphere at least. Um, but Titan has a has a really thick atmosphere, uh, so much so that that you wouldn't necessarily um, even need like a specific spacesuit to hold you down. Like it's a safe place to walk. Don't you need oxygen? I will say that. Um, but it is it's a safe location. So can okay. So yeah. Sorry, I'm distracted because I'm watching what he's doing. So um, you can kind of see a pattern of a couple moons here. So there's a really bright one up top. That's Titan. Um, and then there's two to the left, and uh, that's Rhea and Dione, that, well, reverse order. So the bottom one is Rhea, and the top is Dione. Um, Titan is also 
super interesting because it, it actually has um, liquid on the surface um, of methane and hydrocarbons. Um, so there's lakes and it rains. Um, it's a super interesting place to potentially explore. Um, and I think there are, uh, there's a lot of interest when you're talking about um, life in the universe or life on other planets. I think it, in our solar system, at least, it's, uh, in my opinion, and I guess the opinion of many that, that there will be, uh, that the planets is, is the right place to start. I think there's a lot of, um, interesting things going on on a lot of these, um, moons of Saturn and actually of, um, Jupiter. It's also worth saying that there are um, active missions being planned to explore these moons, um, especially in the case of Titan, there's the Dragonfly mission. Um, and so this is actively a topic of research and actively being looked into um, for future spacecraft. Yeah, and the other moon that we're not actually seeing here because it's too too close, I think, to um, Saturn, so it's getting washed out. Um, it's not quite as uh, reflective, I guess, is Enceladus. Um, Enceladus is also super interesting. It's another one of these moons that um, potentially it's thought, you know, could harbor life. Nobody knows for sure. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the one where the spacecraft Cassini that was out in Saturn flew through the plumes of Enceladus um, and detected a hydrocarbon, um, which is or, uh, which is which is super exciting. So I think there's actually potential for that uh, moon as well. Very exciting. Um, what do you want to say? Oh, we could we could talk more about Enceladus, or we could head to Jupiter either way. Yeah, why don't you uh, do that? Can we also switch the screen to the um, to the clay camera real quick? Just to yeah. So I just wanted to show this um, before Zach comments on that. Um, so this that we're showing here is it's a program called the sky. There's also a free version of this. It's called Stellarium. And basically this is synced to the telescope. So this yellow area bullseye type thing is where we're, where the telescope is pointing. This is a very small field of view. So it's not exactly on, on Saturn, but, um, but these are where the moons are right now. So this is updated. Um, and, and as the night goes on, you'd see the, you'd see the moons move. So this is how we, Kind of know which uh, what the orientation of these moons were. So this was Titan, and it's actually flipped because we're seeing a flipped image of it because of the mirrors and camera and everything. Um, but these are the two on the outer edge, Rhea and Dione. So I just wanted to point that out. Did you want to say something about um, Enceladus? Yeah, um, I'll say a few things about Enceladus. Enceladus is this really interesting moon because um, it's in an eccentric orbit around Saturn, and so as it goes around in its orbit. Um, Saturn stretches and squeezes the moon, and this results in heating of the moon's interior. And in Enceladus, this has a really dramatic effect. Um, the temperature of the ex interior exceeds the boiling point of water, and you get these beautiful jets that shoot out of the moon's south pole hundreds of miles into space. And you can see those jets um, from orbiting spacecraft, and they've been sampled. And that undersea or under ice um, ocean of Enceladus has been considered a prime location to search for life. Yeah. Yeah. It's very exciting. Um, I think I think we should move on to Jupiter. Um, so Jupiter is a short distance from Saturn currently. So um, since we're on this screen, I will show you what we do here. So this is kind of the software. Um, I guess I'll just show you here. So there's, so this is, um, like I said, the sky software. Um, there's also, uh, where did it go? This is the um, telescope control system. So this kind of tells you everything about the telescope. So it tells you where we're pointing here. Um, it tells you information about date and time, dome information, all kinds of stuff. So we can use this to, to move and point the telescope, but, um, but this I like to think of as our cheat sheet. Since it's synced to the telescope, we can kind of search for objects or click on objects. Jupiter's right here. We can kind of see where things are on the sky. Um, so I'll just type in Jupiter and it'll give us information about Jupiter. And then we can, um, we can slew to that object. Um, and before I do that, I think um, we just switched out the camera. So if you want to go back to the planetary camera, 
Let's see if we can, can we show it so you can see what's helpful? Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is just a, a fisheye of the dome. So when I hit the button here, we'll slew, and so it'll get really loud because the telescope and dome are gonna move. I should I should have said this earlier. Everything's computer controlled with this telescope. The other ones were point and click, this or moving with your hands. This one's with all computer controlled, but obviously you see that. So all right, here we go. There's a slight delay and then it'll go. So we're gonna, um, so that same camera is what we're using to actually um, observe the planet here. So, so we're just gonna have to switch that out real quick. Um, but yeah, so Jupiter um, itself is, is it's very interesting. Um, it has um, 80 moons, I believe, something like that. Saturn has something like 60. Um, but Jupiter also has some interesting moons. It's, so its four biggest moons are called the Galilean moons, uh, named after Galileo, who uh, first observed them in the 1600s. Um, and <clears throat> they're all interesting in their own right. Um, actually, the, the one that's showing up closest to... Oh, let's go to the planetary camera real quick. That's beautiful. Or, you want to start with the... Want to start with the moons? Yeah, that's since good. we're talking about that. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, so here you're seeing a washed out Jupiter. We'll, we'll get into more contrast um, in a minute, but um, that closest one to Jupiter is Io. Um, Io is um, the closest end to Jupiter. It is, um, oh, there we go, um, is the most volcanically active or most geologically active body uh, moon in the solar system. It, it has, I don't know the number of volcanoes, but it has many, many volcanoes and is continually um, erupting and, and is very young because of that. Um, and then we have um, on the outer edge, um, let's see, from top to bottom, it's Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Um, and uh, Europa is another one that's uh, of interest to uh, those that study uh, solar system astronomy um, in the search for life. Uh, it's another body that's thought to, uh, or it's another moon that has that has an outer shell of, um, ice and underneath uh we think there's there's water uh liquid ocean um so do you want to talk anything more about some of some of the cool stuff about the moons yeah i'll say um in addition to um Io's vol well, i'll say Io's volcanism and the sub ice ocean on europa are ultimately driven by the same process that drives enceladus's jet um this is all tidal heating this is all due to these moons being stretched and squeezed as they orbit their um, host planets. Yeah. So let's um, let's uh, change the contrast here. I'm going to adjust the position so we can center us on Jupiter. Bit. So this is so what when you see the the you know Jupiter moving around, this is uh, literally me moving the telescope slightly back here. Um, so uh, you're seeing a live view as we move the telescope. And then um, you can kind of see Zach here changing the, uh, the exposure and the gain to kind of bring out different contrasts. So that's a great red spot. Are you seeing that dot there? Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> Oh, might be. I think that might be the shadow of one of the moons. Yeah, it's a, that's interesting. No, I don't think so, because here's the moon. Oh, I'm thinking Io. Yeah, but it's right here. Oh, oh I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can kind of make this this out, that there's different colors. You can see the bands. They're kind of coming in and out of focus again, because, one, it's windy, but also um, we're, we're not looking super low on the horizon, but as you look, like, we call this air mass in astronomy. If you're looking straight up overhead, you're looking through one mass of air, and that's by definition. But as you look lower on the horizon, you're looking through an angle of that. So you're actually looking through more air. And if you look through more air, you're seeing more turbulence. And that's what we call in astronomy seeing. And so in Cambridge, we don't have great seeing. We, we, have, we also have bad light pollution, as, as somebody brought up earlier. 
Um, so there's a lot going going against us here, but but still, you know, even in the middle of a city, we're seeing some pretty cool things. Um, so these these bands that you're seeing on Jupiter um, are actually atmospheric bands, um, and you know, I think the 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 it's thought that it's some mixing of of the atmosphere. Um, Jupiter is a gas giant, so it's made up primarily of hydrogen and helium. And then um, it's not totally known, I think, but as you get lower and lower, um, there's like a liquid core. It's not, I think, completely known if there is a solid core at the at the bottom, but um, but there's it's definitely primarily gas. So there's a lot of mixing um, of the atmosphere. You want to say anything about Jupiter? Yeah, I'll say uh, Jupiter, in addition to being very large, also rotates on its axis extremely quickly. Um, a day on Jupiter is only about 10 hours. And this fast rotation is part of the reason why you get this banded structure. Earth has similar um, bands on it. Um, of course, we rotate much slower. If you kind of heard of the jet stream, other atmospheric effects on Earth, Jupiter is just that, but turned up to 11, which is why you get this very interesting banded structure that's very beautiful to look at. Yeah. And um, and it's also, it, it's known for its great red spot, which is a very interesting uh, storm that's been in existence, uh, we think, for 400 or 300 plus years. Um, <clears throat> continue. Um, and I, I always have a, a hard time um, thinking about the scale and distance of objects in astronomy. Um, still, uh, even though I've been doing this for you. But, um, so I like to always bring it back to like what we know. And, you know, with, with Jupiter, for instance, you know, I think we can kind of get a feel for how big the Earth is, right? Maybe that's even hard, but, but you can actually fit the Earth inside of the Great Red Spot. Um, that's how big that is, you know? I, I forget the number of how many Earths you can fit across it. I don't know if you remember that number. Uh, it's about 13 Earths, I believe, across the whole planet. Yeah. Two in the spot. Yeah. So, um, so about two Earths in the spot and maybe 13 across. Um, and same thing for Saturn. Again, it's hard to comprehend the ring structure, but you can actually fit the Earth through the gap in the ring if you see those more higher resolution imaging. Um, so it just kind of puts it into perspective. It's These are really hard concepts to kind of grasp, I think, distance and space. So that's nice. It's kind of coming in to a little better focus. I see Nadia, is there a question? I wanted to jump in with a question. Someone just asked, um, is it possible to focus more on the planet? Um, can you kind of explain that? Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you might want to say it. But, but yeah. yeah, that's kind of what we've been talking about with the atmosphere is a big problem. Mm -hmm. but go ahead, you want to say something? So a lot of this blurring that you see is not actually due to um, the telescope focus being off, but it's actually inherent due to us looking through the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere has two kind of major effects on astronomical images. The first is it blurs them, and the second is the shaking you can see. So we're actually perfectly focused with the telescope itself, but we have to deal with the atmosphere, unfortunately. This is why we shoot telescopes into space, because you don't have to deal with these effects. Yeah. Yeah, and and you can, if we've been looking at this for, for a little bit here, and you, you'll kind of see... Um, you know, this is always good, true, true too. If you're at, a, if you're actually at a telescope looking through with your eyes, but if if you kind of like watch it for a while, you know, things kind of come in and out of focus. Uh, you kind of see a crisp image and then it might go away. That's going to happen all the time if you're using um, ground-based telescopes. You know, there's some, there's the dome. Um, there's some sites, you know, like on on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii that has really good, you know, atmospheric turbulence or really low atmospheric turbulence. So in those cases, you might have, um, you know, much better seeing than what we're seeing here with the turbulence. But but in general, you know, if you kind of look and watch this for a while, you'll kind of see features kind of come in and out of focus a little bit more. So it's it's kind of the best you can do. Are there any other questions that we want to address about the planet or the telescopes? Um, sure. Let me let me throw one more at you. So on Facebook. Um, someone asked if this telescope can get detailed images of Uranus and Neptune. Mm. Probably not. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, it can it can image them, but um, you're not going to see the the detailed atmospheric structures because they're they're just much farther away. Um, 
and they're not a they're just much farther away um so it would look more like they are resolved so you can actually see that they're you know a disc but it's more like a it would not look much different than a star to be honest um but a star is kind of like a pinpoint um that's whereas this is actually a small disc but you know other than jupiter saturn and sometimes you know uh, mars uh, you don't really get really great resolved detailed images okay no that's a great response um i think we can move on to the next observation if you'd like yes so on to the ring nebula <laughs> yeah so um I'm just going to stick my head out the door. Maybe you just want to say something about the ring nebula really quick. I just want to make sure the wind is doing what it's supposed to do. So yeah, our next target for observation is the ring nebula. The ring nebula is what's called a planetary nebula. And these planetary nebula form when a star, like our sun, um, gets a little bit older. And as the star gets older, it spews most of the hydrogen in its center. And it starts trying to fuse heavier and heavier elements. Um, if you get all the way to iron, you explode, and that's called a supernova. Um, but our sun won't ever get there. It'll stop before it hits iron. And in that case, instead of exploding, you fizzle. Your atmosphere puffs off into space, making these beautiful kind of concentric ring structures that we can see today. So we'll see if we can't go and find the ring nebula. Yeah, is the let's, um, here. yeah, it, yes. I think we can go this direction. Awesome. Um, let's put the planetary camera back uh, yes. and we can see the dome move one more time. And then we're gonna actually now be using our <clears throat> our um, our camera that's on the telescope here. So the one attached to the camera because this now is a, a much fainter object. So we're gonna actually take a longer, so we've been doing like sub, sub second, ex, you know, exposures, but now we're gonna do like a minute exposure or something. Okay, so I'm going to move the telescope as soon as that could just. There we go. Seems out of focus. There we go. Okay. One extra turn. There we go. All right, I wanted to pop in again. Um, Oliver, um, who's seven years old, wants to know if this telescope can see Venus. Oh, let's see, so we can actually. Um, yes, well, so Venus is interesting because it's um, it's an interior planet. So it, it actually, in the sky, it's only visible early, um, early in the evening or, or uh, no, yeah, early in the evening or early in the morning. Um, and it's it's very it's often very close to the sun, so there's only certain times that we can see it. But um, so it doesn't get very high in the sky, I guess is, is another way of saying this. So we're able to observe it, but um, only a select few times. It is um, really really bright in the night sky um, when you when you see it. So um, it's actually almost too well, it is. It's, it's probably too bright for this telescope. Maybe with the planetary camera. We haven't tried with the planetary camera, but um, but yes, you can definitely see it. And the cool thing about interior planets is you can sometimes see a phase on them. So it might actually be a crescent or, or part of that. So anyway, um, good question. Yes. So I think um, to answer the question about solar system objects, this telescope can certainly um, see all the planets. Um, we also can observe asteroids. Um, we can also observe fainter objects in the sky, which is what we're going to do right now. We're going to observe uh, a nebula, which Zach was starting to explain, is the essentially the death of a star, um, similar to our, our own sun. Um, the fate of what will eventually happen in a long time, five billion years. Um, and then we, we can see even uh, all kinds of other objects. So Zach was talk, starting to talk about 
um, the evolution of um, stars. So the more massive stars do go boom, and they um, they go supernova. So we can we can observe those. Those are really cool phenomena. Um, we can see galaxies and star clusters. Um, so you can do a lot of um, different kinds of observations with this telescope. Uh, the camera is slightly dependent. Sometimes you want to look with your eye if it's really bright. Um, if it's fainter, you need the camera. So this is probably a good view to see here. This is our, our camera that we were trying to point out from the PowerPoint earlier. So this is the camera we're going to be using right now. Um, I think we can go to the clay camera view. Actually, I'm going to minimize this. Okay, so um, so this um, <clears throat> this software here on the left is um, it's called Maxim DL. It's just a it's a software tool that can connect to our camera and control it. So um, this window down here is um, how we set the exposure time. I'm just listening to the wind howling. Um, so right now we have this set for 60 seconds. Um, here is our filter wheel. So this is where we can change what kind of light we're look, filtering through. So um, U stands for ultraviolet light. Um, B is blue light, green and is visual or V. Um, we're currently set to the, the R filter, which is red, and then it goes infrared and then even like some narrow band uh, image. So let's start with a, with a red image. I'll take the exposure. Um, I'm going to turn the red lights off because we're observing in the red filter. Um, and we'll we'll wait 60 seconds and then we'll we'll see what the ring nebula is. Did you I didn't quite listen to the whole thing you said, but did you have anything else to say about the ring nebula? Uh, we got about as far as stellar gas. <laughs> okay. Right. You want to continue your conversation for 45 seconds? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? Um so uh, I think where we ended off is that when the sun gets a little bit older, it'll puff out its outer layers and uh, form one of these pretty nebula. This is a star that has already done so, died many years ago. And what we should see, um, if the exposure goes through um, without any problems, is this kind of cloudy, circular puff of gas in space. Um, this gas is mostly hydrogen, um, a little bit of helium, similar to the star's composition, but is spread out far, far away in space, far away from the star. And let's see if we have our image. Oh, oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> oh, did we get clouds? <laughs> nope. Uh, so here's something. So this is live astronomy. So um, when you're, uh, we were talking earlier that there's a mirror that we can either have set to um, to the eyepiece. Actually, we, we should put something. Um, to the eyepiece or to um, the camera, and we had it still set to the eyepiece. So we're gonna, and the other thing we need to do is just change the focus. So um, we'll talk about that in a second. But let's actually do this and take the image while we talk about it. Okay. So um, the telescope focuses at a different focal length. So this camera is at a different distance than the than the um, than the eyepiece. So depending on what we're we're looking at, there's a slightly different focus. So we have to change focus um, back and forth. So we've now changed the focus and moved the mirror, and now we should be able to take that image one more time. Okay. Now in the meantime, while we <laughs> wait for that image, um, a question that often gets raised in astronomy, especially when folks visit an observatory, is why are all the lights red? Why do we have to turn out these red lights? And that reason has to do with your eyes. Um, your eyes get adapted to the dark over time. So the longer you spend in a dark environment, the dimmer things you can see. But if you look at a bright object, your dark adaption vanishes. Rather than seeing dim things, you're pretty much blind again. And you have to wait 30 minutes or more to, be, to become dark adapted again. Red light has this very special property that it doesn't ruin your dark adaption. So if you go to an observatory, all the lights will be red because astronomers are trying to preserve their dark adaption. So why not just a 
the wind <laughs> gust in here. Okay. Now let's see this image again. It should be better, I hope. Okay. That looks so, promising. Okay, here we go. So this is more what we expect. I'm just going to move these out of the way. Um, I'm just changing the street screen stretch here. It's just... Okay, so here's our field of view. So this is um, in the center here is the ring nebula. So I can zoom in on that. Um, and we can kind of look at the structure a little bit, but um, you can barely make out. Um, it'll be more obvious when we look in the, the bluer images because um, color directly relates, relates to temperature. I don't think we've said this yet, but um, just like if you're looking at a flame, like the bluer light is actually hotter than the red light. Um, and this star is a very, very hot star. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very blue. So as we go to the bluer filter, that, that star, the white dwarf is called, um, will kind of become more apparent in the center of this image. But these outer areas are, is the expanding um, <clears throat> gas, and that's ionized gas. So um, we're gonna take three quick images in blue, green, and red, and then we'll make a color image, and you can kind of see the different structures. Let me save this and we can continue talking. Okay. Um, and so we'll come back over here and we will change the filter to uh, green. And I doubt you could hear that, but the filter wheel is literally a wheel and it's like rotating around now. So it's going all the way around to the green filter. So this is the, the visual man. And we'll start another 60 second exposure. And then in Max and DL, we can load up the green, the blue and the red and make that color image. So the blue, um, kind of the central region, which we'll see is um, ionized oxygen. And then as you go out, um, there's, uh, little bit of remaining uh, hydrogen on the exterior, hydrogen alpha. Nadia is back. Hi, Nadia. Hello. We have um, a question about zooming. When you zoom in, are you zooming with the computer or the telescope? Yeah. So that's, um, so it's, it's just zooming in on the image like you would do on your phone. It's not the telescope. This image uh, is saved and downloaded. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's just on the computer. Okay. And one more, is the ring nebula in our galaxy? Yes, yes it is. Uh, it's very far away, but it is in our galaxy. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, here comes our second image, the green band. Oh, I, I don't know if you noticed that, but it changed, like uh, it got smaller um, and that will become apparent why when we actually color combine it, but for now I will save this. Can't see anything. That's not what I meant to do. There we go. Okay. Sorry, there are no lights on, so it's hard to see here. Okay, so we're gonna do one more 60 second image in the blue filter. So I'm just waiting for the filter to change. It's gonna go all the way around, okay. Okay, so I guess it's worth probably mentioning because this will look different, um, <clears throat> that the CCD camera is, is just like your phone, like so many mega, megapixels or something, but, but now it doesn't have those built-in like red-green filters. Now we're looking through a filter wheel, but but it's, it's made up of um, pixels just like that, but it's only 2,000 pixels across, more or less. Um, and each of those pixels, um, has some sensitivity. So when, um, so the way the camera is set up is it's um, not quite as sensitive in blue light. So that's just a property of the camera. So um, the blue image that we're taking now um, is actually about a factor of two or maybe maybe less, um, less sensitive. So even though we're doing the same exposure time, it might not be have as much light that it captures. Um, and So let's see what we got. So that's why, even though it's the same here, I have to change the scaling so you can actually see. 
Okay. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So now I just want to point out, like you could definitely, I can definitely see, I hope you could see that. Let me go in a little bit more. I'm trying to see what it looks like on Zoom. But here's the white dwarf. Um, whoops, uh, I'll go away. Right, so that's not as obvious. Let me save this before we. So if I can compare this side by side to um, the, I'll bring up the red and uh, green image. Let's turn this back on. There we go. Okay, so there's all three. Um, so for the most contrast, we'll look at the red and the. We have two images here. This one on the left is what we're called is our red image. This one on the right is our blue image. And we can see in the blue image, right at the center of the ring nebula, we have this spot. Whereas in the red image, maybe you can kind of make it out, but it's a lot dimmer. Now that spot is the white dwarf, um, and it's the remnants of the star that died and puffed its outer layers um, out into space. The reason it shows up in blue and not red is like what Allison was saying, higher temperatures equate to bluer light. So what this is telling you is that that white dwarf in the center must be really, really hot. And indeed, that's correct. White dwarfs reach extraordinary temperatures um, in excess of 10,000 degrees. Okay, disaster averted. Uh, we're closing the dome, um, but, but we have our images. So I, I call that a success. Um, so let's um, really quickly just show you um, what it's like to make a color color image. We can um, basically open up this tool and um, color combine. So we just assigned to, to each of the filters here, red, green, and blue, the images. Um, and this is kind of scaling. So if we assume that they all have the same, you know, intensity or brightness, and then we can do a, a full scale. So this is, oh, I forgot to okay. Let's align them really quick. Um, so this is just allowing us to align the images in case they were slightly shifted and it uses star matching. So it'll look for a pattern of stars and then overlay them. So I'm going to overlay the image here. And, and I should also note that these images don't look wonderful right now because they haven't been calibrated. Like normally we would correct for all these background variations that you're seeing. So there's lots of so these dark circles, for instance, are dust rings that are on the CCD that are out of focus. There's stripes in here from CCD readout. There's all kinds of uh, stuff in there that gets corrected if you do a proper reduction of the images. But this is just a quick example of how this is done. So I'm just kind of scaling this. So this is just a stacked image. Nothing has been done with the color yet. So this is just stacking it. And I'll say, sure, that looks OK. Um, and then we can now play with the color after I do exactly what I just did. Let's see. Okay, so we'll do a full screen here and play with this color a little bit. So here, you know, this is just a one to one ratio of, of the image. And again, like nothing's corrected on the back. So you're seeing, um, seeing some of that background noise as well. But, but the cool thing is, um, we can kind of change the color, like maybe there's too much green, or maybe we want more red. You know, you could do false color or you could do like real color, right? So we can play with this, but you can actually determine like how much, you know, if we had different, um, oops, if we had different um, scaling features, you could see the different different colors here. Let's see. What happened to the green? Oh, not yet. Was there another question? Yes, actually, um, I wanted to ask you a question that we got from a viewer and then uh, start taking a few more questions since there's only five minutes late uh, mm -hmm. left. 
Um, so we got a question from David. He's 11 years old and he wants to know um, how long it takes to see a nebula after it, I guess, explodes with all this gas that you mentioned earlier. Ooh, great question, David. Um, it depends on the nebula. Um, some nebula expand very, very quickly and some take tens or thousands of years to fully puff up. But uh, we can see nebula of all ages um, in the sky. Some are younger and some are older. OK, great. Thanks, David. Um, let me ask you guys a few more questions. Um, someone asked on Facebook, do the lenses or mirrors ever need replacing or maintenance? Tell us about that. <laughs> Good question. Good question, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, yeah, so just in terms of cleaning, like you can imagine dust falls on it. So we typically uh, clean or wash this this mirror every couple of years or every year, depending on how bad it gets. Um, every now and then that aluminum layer on the telescope needs to get uh, re-aluminized, as they call it. So you actually kind of shave that off and put another thin layer. Um, but it's a process, um, so you only do it when you need to do it. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely there's maintenance. Even the, the refracting telescopes um, need, need cleaning and things like that. Okay, great. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, someone wanted to know if it's possible to use the telescope to observe the ISS. Have you ever done that? That's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think I've observed the ISS with this telescope, but we've definitely, um, we're actually talking about observing Artemis. So Artemis just launched, it's been in the news um, and you can kind of track it. So it's really no different than asteroids or comets. Um, they're moving objects in the sky. And um, what you'll see is like the object moving through the field of view. So if we took multiple images, um, you would just kind of see that, you know, the stars stay fixed, but the object is moving through the sky. But if you really wanted to track the object and, and, and not the stars, like not the same field, you could change the way the telescope um, tracks. So right now it's tracking with the Earth's rotation. So the stars stay fixed, but we could change that number if we know how fast the, the satellite or ISS or whatever is moving. So it's definitely possible, um, except the ISS moves really fast. Yes. So, <laughs> so that would be hard. Yeah. Okay, maybe you'll try it out one of these days. Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's see. Um, looking through the questions here, um, what what is the closest dark sky to Cambridge, Massachusetts? Do you guys know? Jerry Springs. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the clubs here, or even the, some of the classes, we often go um, north to like Halibut State Park. Um, we you can see the. Um, the Milky Way, if you go up there, um, it's it's a, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, you know, drive um, on the North Shore of Massachusetts, and it's a it's a beautiful state park. And uh, at night, you can kind of you'll find you won't be alone there. If it's clear, there will be others with um, telescopes in the parking lot. Um, but even just to go out to see, you'd be amazed at how many stars you could see, and 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 the Milky Way, which is incredible. All right, so we have one minute left. So I'm gonna ask you this last question and then we're gonna close out. Um, so is it ever possible to visit the Clay Telescope? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I, I don't know if I explicitly said this, but so this telescope is our teaching telescope. So this is used for all the undergraduate classes. So if you come and you know, take a class at Harvard and have an you know astronomy lab that goes with it, this is the telescope we use. Um, it's also used for, you know, research um, projects for students and things like that. So it, it's really our, our only telescope on campus that's used. So we don't really open it up to the public every now and then, you know, if there's an exciting event, we sometimes have an open, an open house or something like that, but it's mostly for the Harvard community. It, it's usually the telescope at the, at the Center for Astrophysics, the Clark telescope that, where we do the, the more public events, but, um, but every now and then we, we do have, uh, have a few events with open to the public. And we'll make sure to advertise them when they come along. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna close out observatory night. Um, first off, Allison and Zach, thanks for staying up late with us and thanks for being out in the cold uh, tonight. 
We really, really appreciate it. I thought it was an amazing presentation. Um, and so this concludes Observatory Night. Thanks for everyone who joined us. We look forward to seeing you again for our next Observatory Night, which should be um, after the new year. And we'll make the announcements on social media, on our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn channels. So please check our website, cfa.harvard.edu, for more information at the Center for Astrophysics. Thank you again, and good night.